So, um, Ms. Are hey, you ready, Madam uh, Clerk? All right, we'll call the Committee of the Whole to order uh, for January 26, it says on my agenda. Um, Ms. Hale, could you do the land acknowledgement? So I'll just me to swallow what's in my mouth. Oh, okay. Just what closest to me, so I'm, I'm good. We would like to acknowledge that the city and borough of Juneau is on Klingit land and wish to honor the indigenous people of this land. For more than 10,000 years, Alaska Native people have been and continue to be integral to the well being of our community. We are grateful to be in this place, a part of this community, and to honor the culture, traditions, and resilience of the Klingit people. Thank you, Ms. Hale. Um, so the clerk will note the roll. Everyone's here except Mr. Brayson and Ms. Wall. And uh, any changes to the agenda? I don't see any from the manager. I see no one raising their hand. All righty. Um, we will adopt that agenda. And uh, the first thing is federal funding issues update. There's a memo in your packet that has uh, most of the update, but Ms. Kester has some extra things to say. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, you have a memo in your packet that just walks through an update of federal issues. And so we have Katie Catchell, CBJ lobbyist, uh, here to um, go over a couple of the federal issues. Second part of the memo uh, talks about funding, federal funding that has been secured. And then the third part of the memo talks about perspective federal funding. So really the memo is just a way to organize our conversation today, making sure we don't uh, duplicate ourselves and talk about things that, that you can read in the memo. So I'm gonna let uh, Ms. Catchell uh, start us off and then I'll pick up after her. Okay. Ms. Catchell, go ahead. Yes, hi. So some of these topics were discussed this morning, but um, just to go over them again, the NOAA subport property was something that we worked on last year and successfully got enacted into legislation. So going forward, prospectively, we're going to be uh, we're focused on implementing that and making sure that we're in communication with NOAA, the Coast Guard, and um, the congressional delegation to get that moving. Icebreaker home porting in Juneau. Uh, that one is, um, we got some bad news in the FY, sorry, <clears throat> 23 omnibus uh, bill that that uh, funding for that icebreaker is not in there. I'm sorry. Mm. Um, do you have any water? Sorry. Fresh water for you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So prospectively, what we'll be looking for going forward is funding in the FY24 budget for that icebreaker from the Coast Guard. Approach light system at Juneau Airport. I mentioned this this morning, we will be looking at the FAA reauthorization bill to be changing um, some laws that will allow the use of AIP funding uh, to um, build out the approach lighting on that airport. And then congressionally directed spending, we will be pursuing CDS, um, depending on what we decide on this memo. And um, we have secured 7 million for the Juno North Douglas crossing and 2.5 million for the municipal composting. Thank you, Ms. Cattle. Um, okay, we have a question from Madam Mayor. Give your voice two seconds, but on the approach lighting system, um, you said a change in law. I'm assuming that's federal law that has to be changed to make it. Yes, work. Madam Mayor. It's um, regarding the use of airport improvement funds 
Um, currently, uh, there's an allocation that goes to Juno Airport and federal funding, but it is not um, allowed to be used on FAA facilities. And we would like the Mauser system to remain an FAA facility, um, but not use the money that would change it to ownership to Juno. I'm really excited about that. Um, okay, Ms. Uh, anyone else? No question. Okay, Ms. Kester. Thank you. I'm going to just give a brief project update on the uh, congressionally directed spending that has been secured. Uh, we're very grateful to Senator Murkowski's office and, of course, the work of uh, Katie Ketchell and her team. Um, the Juno Douglas North Crossing, we have $7 million to initiate um, NEPA, so environmental permitting and study for that project. We are also uh, pursuing a raise grant uh, to uh, finish NEPA and be able to initiate some design for that project. So really exciting opportunities there. The Public Works and Facilities Committee had a update at the uh, They are also scheduling a public meeting for uh, the, the public to be able to address the assembly. So look at your calendars for that um, invitation to really engage in some dialogue with the public on that. Uh, the other uh, win for congressionally directed spending for CBGA was municipal composting. That is, of course, uh, waste diversion is one of the assembly's goals and just wanted to uh, let the assembly know that although we haven't done a lot of um, planning on this particular uh, project, the, the, the facility that is um, municipal composting, we are working uh, with local experts and we will be launching, uh, launching that feasibility uh, to really get that project underway as soon as possible. We don't have the, the appropriation in hand yet. Um, as Ms. Catchell mentions in the memo, uh, the way that congressionally directed spending works is you still have to be eligible for a sub-account, so you have to otherwise be eligible as a grant. So you still have to go through an application process and, you know, and, and, jump through those hoops to access those funds. So really looking forward to that. We are also applying for a, a grant to expand the municipal composting site, really address waste diversion issues holistically. So um, any questions on either one of those two projects before I mention um, the kind of future looking congressionally directed spending? Anybody? Okay, go ahead. Oh, uh, oh I don't see, oh, you're, off the screen uh, for me. Um, uh, Mr. Smith, go ahead. Thank Your you, Madam hand. Deputy Mayor. Um, I, I, th I heard Ms. Kester say it, and it was just, it, and I know there's cons considerations, of course, when working with a private business, but um, I, di I did just, you know, want to confirm that, you know, we do have local expertise and that there is a, a business operating in town collecting and processing um, compost from homes. And so, um, but I, I thought I did hear you say that, you know, working with local experts is is part of the plan. And um, anyway, just wanted to confirm that. And I don't know if you can actually, could you, if there's anything else you can share about that, I'd appreciate it. Ms. Custer. Yeah, thank you for that opportunity. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, we've got some uh, really successful local business here uh, who knows how to compost in Southeast. Uh, so working uh, with that business to the extent uh, possible as we do the planning will, will be a key part of moving forward. The municipal composting facility is really um, needs to be able to handle large scale composting. So right now, um, there are thousands of, I think it's 5,000 tons, we estimate, of organics that are going into the landfill. So there's tremendous capacity to expand um, and really just target some of our commercial uh, big producers of that waste. And, and a, a site of that size will require special equipment like depackaging equipment. It will uh, require uh, just some kind of larger scale operations. So the, the idea is really to meet that unmet uh, need. Also, uh, we, we will pursue a public-private partnership, much like how we pursue household hazardous waste or how we um, manage household hazardous waste recycling junk vehicle program. The, the idea is not to uh, have a department of uh, composting at CBJ, but rather provide a facility for a private business to take that on with their expertise. Oh, you have a question. Um, Madam Mayor. 
I don't really have a question. I just wanted to, you glossed over it. I'm just making sure the general public knows that this won't be individuals. This is targeting the big commercial food waste folks. And you wanted to speak to that just briefly. I thank you, Madam Mayor. We really feel like um, between uh, restaurants and uh, grocery stores, based on our industrial user survey that the utility did, some of this waste goes down the drain, which is another reason why the CBJ is concerned, because when it goes down the drain, it makes our water treatment more expensive because it introduces organics into our system. And so um, certainly the, the low hanging fruit uh, for a municipal composting facility is are those commercial clients and we have no interest in competing with a private sector business that is doing really well uh, with residential services. No other questions. Go ahead. <clears throat> That's me. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I wanted to just highlight a few of the items on your legislative priority list that uh, may be good candidates for congressionally directed spending. Um, as the memo mentions, it's not just like a wish list and these are our top five. We, there are categories um, of spending that um, have different amounts. Our delegation has different spheres of influence. So we can't really say today, we think these are the best projects. But of course, with Ms. Catchell's uh, experience, we can kind of predict what has been funded in the past and what has been successful in the past. And so uh, these are the projects that we see likely kind of being great candidates. And the first one of those is the CBJ radio system replacement. This body has heard a lot about the needs uh, for our public safety and, and our radio equipment. Um, the request that you'll see in your, uh, in your list is for $2 million. Of course, it's a $14 million project. The Assembly's designated $2 million in the 1%. Um, this is just based on the advice of Ms. Catchell. Again, it's not a giant pot to bite, take tangible bites. If that changes, you know, we're gonna we're gonna pivot and, and ask for more because the need is certainly there. So there, there is that amount of flexibility in this list, and I just want to make sure you're all aware of that. The second um item that we think would be a good candidate is the uh, request from the Mendenhall Wastewater Treatment Plant for fats, oils, and grease and grit removal. This basically just takes the nasty stuff out of our, uh, our wastewater, which makes it uh, more efficient to treat. So we, we've been working on efficiencies at the wastewater treatment plant, uh, working under our COBC. And so um, you know anything that we can do to uh, improve our processing will not only help the quality of our effluent, but also um, the bottom line for our ratepayers who um, inevitably have to pay for those improvements. Um, the third project is Lemon Creek Multimodal Path. This is a great uh, transportation project. And of course, we've pursued this uh, last year and are pursuing grants for it. And you know, uh, take the opportunity to, to go into a little more detail for uh, the next project on the list, which is Capital Civic Center. And the reason I wanna uh, pause on this is because uh, a lot of work has been done since this body reviewed that project. And so I wanna take a moment to um, give the, the body an update on it so that you're, you're well aware. As you recall, the assembly appropriated uh, $2 million to help the vision of a Capital Civic Center, a joint facility that uh, would both serve as a convention center and an arts uh, center and really uh, shine shine for the capital city in all of those those ways uh, that that uh, was championed by the uh, the alliance which is a organization um, with travel Juno chamber the partnership and Jack and so you see many of many of them in the in the audience here uh, so the the assembly, this group, the Alliance, got together and advocated for this joint facility. Um, the assembly uh, appropriated a small amount of funds to kind of start exploring that. The group came back to the assembly and said, it's a, it's a really big price tag. At that time, it was an $85 million price tag for this joint facility. Keeping in mind, we've been you know living this time of, of great cost escalation. So the assembly said, uh, okay, Go back to the drawing board, spend some more funds. You appropriated $2 million. Spend some more funds, really kind of dialing it down, looking at if there can be efficiencies. Uh, kind of the, the $85 million was a very rough estimate. And so that direction was given. 
uh, to CBJ Engineering and to the Alliance. And um, a lot of really good work was done by all the stakeholders in determining, you know, what do we actually need? What can we share? And I will, um, I didn't, didn't bring it to throw up on the screen because I uh, assume you all have the uh, floor plans in front of you. But basically, this is the result. I think this is the sixth draft that we have of uh, going through the, the space needs process for the programming for Capital Civic Center. So you'll see, you know, the first, the first slide has parking, um, really talks about the site plan, talks about the flow of uh, how you access the facility. There's really good flow for like backstage, for bringing in your VIPs. Um, so that's, that's a big improvement to this facility. If you turn the page uh, to your first floor plan, um, a lot of really uh, innovative work was done to make the lobby both a space that would not take up too much square footage because uh, square footage costs money, but still a space that could solve, that could serve as like a secondary entertaining site. So you could host a reception in here. You could, um, you know, kind of have that be a, uh, a, a usable space and have really good flow. Um, you'll also see on this first floor uh, a really nice courtyard adjacent to a cafe that can be both serve as a cafe and a gift store um, that has some multi functionality as far as you know closing it off to private events. You see the community hall, which is a, a, a request um, by by the voters to um, really. You know, the vision is you do, you demo the jack and then have the community hall incorporated into the Capital Civic Center. And then the second floor is uh, mostly meeting rooms. So there was a big uh, concern from the public. And, and this is in 2019 when uh, the upgrades to Centennial Hall were discussed. There was a lot of comments from the public about what do we need in a convention center? And so incorporating all of those things, this design really has done a good job at uh, doing that. So... That's my very, uh, very brief, and I want to be co uh, cognizant of time overview of um, Capital uh, Civic Center. Before I pause, I'd like to, uh, we, your packet has a um, economic analysis that the Alliance and CBJ had McKinley Group do, and we just want to briefly touch on that because there's a lot of really good info in there on the economic benefit of the project. But before I do that, I want to pause and ask if there are any questions on uh, the progress that Capital Civic Center has made since the assembly appropriated funds to further that vision. And I will let you know, we have not spent $2 million on this vision. So uh, this, this is not a $2 million vision, but we feel like it's a really good floor plan that can be used uh, by the Alliance as they advocate for federal funding. Thanks, Ms. Hughes Candies. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. When those $2 million were as appropriated uh, before we had a general plan and not uh, really detailed part of when talking about the cost estimate, and that was in the very early stages of construction costs going up, part of the thing that the assembly wanted was uh, to a certain percentage actually detailed design so that we would have any kind of confidence that the cost estimates were closer. So how would you characterize, characterize this floor plan in terms of like engineering? What, what stage of design is this? Ms. Kester. Yeah, thank you for that question. This is still on the concept level of design. So it is not a cost estimate that gives us a degree of certainty. Uh, the cost estimate is $75 million that they've, we've basically been able to shave about $10 million off the project through uh, efficiencies and shared spaces. Um, you know, I feel like with the need for federal funding in this project, um, we have a really good kind of idea of what it would look like. There's still a lot of contingency built into that idea, kind of layers of contingency upon contingency. And so, um, you know, I think this is a good uh, vision for being able to advocate for the project and, and move it forward. But I don't think this, 
this can give the assembly a level of certainty that says we're not going to go over this price tag uh, at the at this moment in time. The, the more we delay the project, of course, the more expensive it would be would come. But um, I, I think the hope would still be that there's room to shave off. So I mean, this this has a this has all the same contingencies built into it uh, that that we've seen in previous iterations of the project. Does that answer your question? So it's it's not the it sounds like it's not, it's, you know, someone threw around the number 30% before. This is not, this is a layout. It's not designed. Oh yeah, it is. It is not 30% yeah. design yeah. even. Okay. No, nope. no, nope. it's conceptual, which is like yeah. before we even put percentages on it. Yeah. Thanks, Helpful. Uh, other questions? Okay. Keep on, keep on going. Thank you. I, I'd like to invite Susan Bell up to uh, give an overview of the economic analysis. Thank you, Ms. Bell, for coming. Thank you. I'm Susan Bell, um, formerly president of McKinley Research Group, now senior consultant. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak, and my half-life on my comments was reduced each time I spoke to Katie, so I have very brief remarks. I've, I've emailed them to Katie. I've also brought uh, 10 copies, and in saying that, I also want to say that the Juno Chamber and Alaska Chamber have asked that this be the topic of next week's luncheon, so there will be a detailed presentation for assembly members, members of the public next Thursday at the Hangar Ballroom. So I'm just really going to hit the highlights. Um, we completed this study, as Katie described, in August for the Alliance, and she's described the, you know, the concept of the facilities, um, our focus was the market demand and economic benefits. And key, I'm going to start with key findings, a little bit on the methodology, and see what questions you have tonight. A key finding is definitely that, you know, it, under renovations are underway right now, that Juno needs to upgrade our facilities to remain competitive in the media and conference market. And because of our role as a capital city, we have a lot of demand, including during legislative session, but, but, um, but other times of the year with government related meetings and conferences, as well as a wide variety of nonprofits, trade organizations, and others that, that want to come to the capital city. Um, local resident usage of the facility, whether they're local events or local attendance at conferences and events, is estimated about 90%. And that's similar to other small communities, small and mid sized communities in Alaska. Anchorage is very, very different with its. Um, large facilities and aggressive marketing campaign and Furbanks is sort of in the middle, but that 85 to 90% is really similar when we look at Valdez, Sitka, Ketchikan and others. A big question we had in our mind as we rolled into this project in the spring and early summer months was what, you know, what relationship will we have with in-person events post COVID or with COVID or whatever status we're in right now. And one of the things we heard loud and clear from event organizers, organizers who are local events, um, uh, trade organizations that regularly hold their meetings here, conferences, is that it, the intent was for meetings to come back. There might be hybrid models as we've experienced, but there's also a huge appetite. Um, I spoke earlier today with Liz at Travel Juno because I just wanted, knowing that we completed this work at the end of July, early August, we just wanted to see where we were now. And she shared her, she shared the report that Travel Juno keeps working closely with um, June Arts and Humanities Council, they're booking events and conferences out to 2026. So the assumptions we had, the big question that we had at the time we did the report, it's it's bearing out and they are coming back. Um, no doubt our travel costs, um, you know, our air costs and our hotel room inventory are factors when people, you know, our competitive position, but they're coming back. The report detailed recent usage pre-COVID for both um, Centennial Hall and the Juno Arts and Culture Center, and then our projections. And when, when you have a chance to look at the report, we have projected usage by weekend and weekend, you know, um, for, for the new Capital Civic Center, um, looking at the differences. So the, the, um, the ballroom, the community hall, meeting rooms and other things. So you can look at, the, you can see that detail and see how that translates to revenue projections. So again, keeping with high points, we project not only a return to in-person events, fairly similar with a little growth compared to what we had pre-COVID, but also revenue increase. 
And we project the revenue increase for several factors. One of them is a modest rate increase of 10% was factored into our estimates. There are more rentable spaces, allowing a single organization like Alaska Travel Industry Association is a good example. When they come to Juneau, they, they have to plan for not only lower attendance than in Juneau and Anchorage, but also they can't do some of the revenue generating things for their own organization, like a full, you know, a robust trade show. So, so there are some, there's some you know, more rentable spaces, some concurrent usage, a modest rate increase. And then also some of the organizations, this factored more into our economic analysis, can have a larger attendance when, when the space is more usable for meals. You know, I, I look around the room and I can tell, I mean, all us have worn hats where we plan facilities there and you have to, you have to design your agenda around the space. We also projected modest growth, uh, and I, I, I personally am more bullish on it, but we, but we like our economics to be conservative. Modest growth that by year five, there would be two new 200-person conferences. We didn't name that, but again, with a new facility um, and, and our role as capital city um, and, the, and what we were seeing already with the return of the market, we, we projected a couple of small conferences. Um, from economic benefits, I know this was key. We were looking at the facility itself and its revenue generating potential as a facility, but also community benefits. We were projecting that spending for large conferences and events would be $7 million in new money to Juno annually by year five, and then associated construction spending estimates, um, but employment and local spending. At the time we did this report, we used 48 million, and I know that's a moving target that, um, so we we just we needed a number to plug in, and that's what we did for our economic impacts of construction. Community benefits, just as I close, certainly uh, these facilities are are built by communities for their social, educational, cultural, and business um, uh, benefits. This kind of facility attracts, you know, enhances our quality of life, helps us attract workforce and retain workforce. Certainly, the economic activity is significant. And especially in the fall, winter, and spring months when our economy changes dramatically. And then just to close, I'll just touch briefly on the methodology. We we have the benefit with a facility like this to be able to pour over the details of what historical use has been. We talked with a lot of people. We talked with nearly 50 people, event planners, trade organizations, meeting planners, um, the, the city staff. Um, at some of our comparable facilities, we looked at Sitka. Sitka Harrigan, um, Harrigan's um, Centennial Hall, Sitka's Performing Arts Center, Valdez Civic Convention Center, and also an out-of-state facility called Seaside Civic Center in Oregon. Um, the municipal staff that we talked to was very generous with their time, with their revenue expectations and unique things. Um, and then also we looked again at our current facilities and we did the economic analysis. Did I keep in my allotted time? <laughs> Excellent job. <laughs> um, hopefully, will anybody have what questions do you have for Ms. Bell <clears throat> about the uh, Madam Mayor has a question. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Bell. Um, the new $7 million a year by year five, where is that $7 million? Where do you see most of that landing? That's a common. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That's a combination of spending at the facility, but very significant spending is with our local hotels, our caterers, transportation, um, and then and other you know other things that are part of um, putting on events. You know, so it might be set design, it might be um, you know florists and other things. But hotels and our food and beverage aspect of that industry are very significant. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Um, Mr. Smith doesn't have one. Um, so I guess we are good for now. And thank you for coming. And we'll look forward to hearing more. Did you say, tell us again when the thing is that and where it is? Next Thursday, February 2nd. It's the, during legislative session, it's the joint meeting of Juno Chamber and Alaska Chamber. And so it'll be at the Hangar Ballroom. Okay, and I welcome questions from assembly members and staff at any time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, okay, uh, Ms. Kester, did you have anything else? No, you have heard me talk long enough. Thank you, very, uh, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, before we get off the Civic Center Centennial Hall, 
uh, why we have the advantage of Ms. Ketchell here. Um, I was one of the group that went to um, solicit more funding last thing, and I, the Honorable Mayor Smith is here also. She joined me. Um, and we were close. I mean, Murkowski, Senator Murkowski was very excited about it. And unfortunately, Congressman Young was really, really thrilled about it. And we actually thought we had him. But life changes on us. Um, so not only have we made the project smaller, I'm just wondering, um, as we think about this, if it would behoove us at some point to reserve a little bit money for this whole project, because we know we're going to have to do it at Centennial Hall. Would that benefit us when we go? I think it's the CDS is now the new term for your mark, but I'm just wondering your opinion on that. Ms. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I would definitely agree with putting a little bit of local skin into the game. Uh, not only does it show local commitment and support, but it uh, also helps bring the project to a level of readiness that um, lowers the risk for the federal government. Um, if they are funding something that is kind of half-baked, it's you know something that they're not going to take a risk on. Um, the more money that's already involved in a project, the better. And with such a, um, a price tag uh, of $75 million, uh, those CDS accounts, um, I mean, that's like a big number for that account. Usually you see $1 to $5 million. Um, Senator Murkowski was able to get $20 million for some projects, but those $20 million projects were homeless youth, youth shelters in rural Alaska. So you kind of have to Put that into the calculus as well um, from a you know needs point of view and with the senator having to juggle many priorities across the state all right thank you for that i have one more go ahead um has congresswoman Kaltola said anything about earmarks on her end <laughs> well um we're uh, working with Congresswoman Peltola to get them um, up to speed on what happened last year with earmarks um, because she wasn't around for that. So I'm doing my best to kind of educate her staff who was uh, quite new at you know, the earmarking game and uh, legislative issues at a congressional level. So uh, we'll be working with them, but all signs point to, you know, she will be requesting earmarks. It's just um, helping them with the process. You did? Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Um, so we are ready to go to the priority list that we we talked about this morning. Um, and those of us who got our votes in on time did the voting. And uh, I am going to find the paper in my paper. 65? No. Yeah. Here it is. Okay, great. Um, and we talked about some this morning about the relative whether it had to be precise, number one, number two. Um, generally, when we do these things, you know, this, li this list looks not like any one of us voted, but it's all of us together. So um, are there any comments on this and anything you'd like to change? Ms. Hughes-Candies. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I know we talked this morning about how it's not, you know, just these top five, um, but it sounds like when looking at um, specific asks that then they go back and see where it falls on the ranking. So with that in mind, um, hoping not to open this back up and get too into the details, but uh, I would move that we move the Juno North Douglas crossing um, back to its ranking of number two to where it was last year. And I can talk more about that if people want, or I can just make that motion. I think that's probably good. Is there any, you heard Ms. Hughes Gandy's motion. Is there any objection to that motion? I'm looking at you and nobody's raising their hand. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, what about the rest of the list? Does someone want to move that, Madam Mayor? <laughs> yeah, I guess that's that someone. Um, before we move that, I don't know if we want to briefly touch on Bartlett Regional Hospital's request. Um, because once we move, unless we can add that to the list afterwards, I'm not saying I'm supporting it, but I don't know if you want to do that first. Um, 
Sure, we could talk about the Bartlett. I mean, this is all we have on it. We usually have a little longer discussion than none. Um, what's the what's the people's thought about the Bartlett adding the Bartlett thing or not, M Madam Mayor? We'll all get auctions. I've talked quite a bit, so I mean, we'll all we'll all get auctions. Go ahead. Just in understanding processes here. Um, is there anything preventing us from doing a, a better, is this necessary to do right now? Or is there anything preventing us from having a more robust discussion on this, um, possibly through committees or, you know, uh, in, and then adding it later? Is that a possibility or do we have to make a decision on this now? Um, Mr. Watt. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I think I think it's time to make a decision. We've got to enter projects in CAPSIS and uh, give Ms. Catchell uh, direction. And I'm sure there's a federal schedule that we're trying to meet. So it, it, it's time. Um, Ms. Hale. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I, um, I'm, I'm not intimately familiar with this, but I do support this request. And I will also point out that um, in my time um, as liaison uh, to the Bartlett Board, uh, what I found was often our facilities here in Juneau were um, were facilities that people came to from around the state. So it makes a lot of sense to request state funding uh, to support this facility because we we support not just Juneau, but Southeast Alaska and actually other uh, communities up north. Um, does someone have a motion to add it to some number? Um, I have a motion. Oh, go ahead. Just just to process a little bit more, how is this coming now or where was the hospital? And it's been through, I know, Ms. Cus Director Custer is working really hard through a multiple month process. So I'd love to know why the hospital yeah. is like, yes. oh, and this. Exactly. Mr. Mr. Watt. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, it's no secret the hospital's been having a little bit of a transition. Um, and uh, when uh, Director Kester reached out to all of the departments and enterprise boards uh, on this process in the fall, they didn't participate. They had a lot going on. Um, I think they understand that they should have participated earlier. Um, I think that doesn't diminish the fact that they have a good project and a need. So it would be, I think, probably best to incorporate it on the list somehow. Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, <laughs> this is a tough one for me. I, I support the project. I think it's a really good community need. Um, I really dislike the fact that it's thrown at us at the last minute. Um, I know that uh, we, some of us personally asked Ms. Kester to reach out to our enterprise funds and make sure we got our stuff in so we'd have one comprehensive list. But with that being said, it's a unique project. And there might be some unique funding coming along the way, either state and federal. So my motion would be, sorry, I'm speaking for my motion before I make it unusually. <laughs> I would add it number 23 to the list, just in case there's some unique uh, behavior health grant. But I certainly wouldn't rank it in front of anything else because we've already been through that process. And um, that's all I have. So that's my motion. Uh, comments on the mayor's motion. Um, Ms. Treem. And then Mr. Smith, thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, I, I agree with everything the mayor just said. I, I do wanna say the hospital board met on Tuesday. Who knows what time means? Um, and I did hear about this. It's actually already been entered into CAPSIS. So whether or not we put it on our list, it's the request has already been made. But I do, um, share the frustrations with the process this year support the project and support the mayor's motion. <laughs> Mr. Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Maybe I misread or misremembering, but I actually thought that the hospital was like specifically excluded from being reached out to at some point, but maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. Ms. Kester could maybe help me with that. Mr. Watt or Ms. Kester? Uh, no, I think uh, generally we try to incorporate all of the boards. Um, you know, I think from a, a, at least a, a state or federal perspective, if we're asking our elected officials to support our projects, um, those those uh, elected officials are generally going to have limited ability to help Juno get funds. So if they 
if they help in one program or another, it's coming out of that limited ability. So I think I think you need to keep them all on the on the CBJ list um, that falls under the assembly. Madam Deputy Mayor. Who's talking? Mr. Mr. Smith. Smith. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I maybe I didn't understand the manager's response. I guess what I thought is that I, I did not believe the hospital was actually asked to participate or to submit projects. But maybe I'm maybe just Miss Kester. Talking past each other. Thank you. I'm ha I'm happy to take that. So um, when we introduce the uh, legislative process, legislative priority process to Public Works and Facilities Committee in September, and ask for them to approve a schedule, uh, part of the cover memo was like uh, generally uh, the airport and. Um, the hospital haven't participated in this list because they have independent funding sources. At that meeting, um, Assemblymember Smith specifically asked for um, all boards and commissions to be included. And so um, that direction was given. And we have on multiple occasions sent, there's over 40 boards and commissions. And so we, on multiple uh, occasions, uh, solicited input from uh, the chair and the lead staff of uh, all of those boards and commissions. And feedback from uh, some of them and and nothing from others. So that, that was how the process worked. Thank you. Be clear, you did ask the hospital. Okay, that's what Ms. Okay, thank Ms. You. Smith wants to know. <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay, you've heard the mayor's motion and um, I'm not gonna object. I would move it up further, but um, I get the frustration. A any objection to mayor's motion? Okay, so we'll add that for 23. And um, then you moved the whole list, did you, Madam Mayor? Um, I moved the whole, the uh, revised, uh, what are we calling this? <laughs> uh, legislative capital or FY24 legislative capital priority list to the full assembly. Any comments, any objection to the motion? Okay, thanks. Thank you for um, all that work. It's not a list. N none of us would have voted exactly that list, but it's. A, I think it's a good representation of what our community needs. So I think it's good. Um, anything else to come before the committee of the whole? Anybody? I have a quick question. Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, just going back to the Civic Center Centennial Hall. So that's our latest and greatest idea, close enough that... Uh, if the Alliance were want to go seek um, more funding, that's probably the project that we would be looking for, right? Is that correct? Looking at you, Ms. Ms. Kester. Ms. Kester. <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor Weldon, for the opportunity to clarify. I think if um, if the group, the Alliance could get, and CBJ staff could kind of get a nod from uh, the assembly that, that these floor plans and this vision is sufficient to bring forward to advocate with federal delegation, advocate with the state delegation. That would be uh, th that would be a, a good outcome from this meeting and we will set set them off to do great things. I make that motion, Madam Chair. <laughs> okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. Could you tell me what the motion is just? Um, that this, the latest concept is something to move forward at this time for CBJ, to, whatever you said, Ms. Kester, CBJ to work on and the Alliance to seek funding. Something, what what did you say, Ms. Kester? That sounds good. <laughs> is that good? Yeah. Do we, you want to add anything? The assembly Ms. supports okay. this, this concept. Yes. Thank you. Uh, is there an objection to that motion? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for that. Um, and I think we're good, yeah? Anybody have anything else they wanna say? Ma Mr. Watt, Ms. Kester, Ms. Ketchell, anybody? Uh, Madam Mayor. Happy retirement party to Ms. Glashevsky. Thank you very much. Adjourned.